We have entitled this three-part chapel series this week, Sexuality and Wholeness, with Dr. Bill Struthers on Monday, Dr. Lisa McMinn on Wednesday, and Wesley Hill for today. One day, we trust that we will be able to introduce Wesley Hill as Dr. Wesley Hill, since he is working on a PhD in New Testament studies at Durham University, hoping to finish next year. By the way, once again, I want to thank those students who have been working with student government and the chaplain's office in putting together additional sessions beyond this chapel week, additional sessions under the theme Sexual and Sanctified. Be aware of two more events coming up next week. On Monday night, a faculty panel will speak on the theme Sexual Christians. That panel will include Dr. Brian Howell, Dr. Luisha Hawkins, Dr. Cynthia Neal Kimball, and Dr. Reed Shushart. A panel discussion with Q&A will be held on Monday at 7 in Phelps. And then on Wednesday of next week, a guest speaker, Dr. Jennifer Robeck Morse, will be lecturing on the topic, Same-Sex Marriage Affects Everyone. And that lecture will be held on Wednesday at 7.30 in the Kresge Room. I know that's too much information. Just a heads up on these things. Last summer, I read a pre-publication copy of Wesley Hill's book, Washed and Waiting, with the subtitle, Reflections on Christian Faithfulness and Homosexuality. As soon as I read this book, I knew that it would be great if we could get Wesley to speak in chapel. Why? Because Wesley is a Wheaton grad himself, class of 2004, so he knows Wheaton. His writing is thoughtful, biblical, and theological. His style is personal, memoirish, and compelling, and his story is one that we need to hear. My first choice was to see if Wesley's schedule could possibly allow for a visit to Wheaton for this chapel series on sexuality and wholeness. The only problem is that Wesley is studying in the UK, and we didn't know if we could get that to work. Well, we did, and Wesley's here. In addition to the chapel this morning, Wesley will be offering a Q&A session this afternoon at 4.15 in the Phelps Room, Lower Beamer. Please welcome to chapel this morning, Wesley Hill. Well, let me just say that it's really great to be back at Wheaton. Um, I was telling some friends uh, this morning that I think, if my memory serves me right, that I have not been in this chapel since graduation. I've been back to campus to visit, but I haven't been in chapel. Uh, so this is filled with a lot of memories for me, and it's really great to be here, so thanks for having me. Um, if you have a Bible with you, I wanted to read a section from Mark's Gospel, uh, Mark chapter 10. And I'll begin reading at verse 17, and I just want to spend a few minutes reflecting on this passage of scripture and, and what it has to say to us in our sexual lives. So Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. And as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything and followed you. 
Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. I'd like to frame what I have to say today with the second half of that story from Mark's Gospel. In this story, it seems that Jesus' disciples are afraid of being left on the outside of the circle of God's saving grace. Having just seen a rich man depart with Jesus' pronouncement, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, the disciples wonder about their fate. If the rich, those who were supposed to be a sure bet as candidates for salvation, may miss the kingdom, then what hope is there for the rest of us? Almost in an effort to shore up his own chances, Peter blurts out to Jesus, see, we've left everything to follow you. He seems to be hoping that Jesus will affirm him here. Yes, Peter, I can see that. You're safe. Since you made such a great sacrifice on my behalf, I'll guarantee you a spot at the heavenly banquet. Interestingly, that's not the response Jesus gives. Rather than buttress Peter's confidence in his own heroic efforts, Jesus undercuts that sort of self-reliance. He says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Notice Jesus doesn't condemn Peter's choice to leave behind his fishing nets and follow Jesus. Jesus is the one who commanded him to leave his nets and follow him. Instead, Jesus shifts Peter's perspective on that act of self-denial. Rather than view it as a badge of honor or a kind of qualification ensuring him a place on heaven's roster, Peter should understand his forsaking the life he'd always known as a venture in receiving from Jesus, a life so full of grace and glory that any sacrifice made to obtain it pales by comparison. If Peter has left behind his family, Jesus says, he receives a new family in his discipleship. If Peter has given up property, he inherits a choicer piece of real estate. If he forsakes a fine house, he gains a new home. If he gives up his life, then in Jesus' favorite paradox, he gains it. Following me, Jesus seems to say, isn't simply about relinquishing things. It's about receiving the abundance of eternal life. It's this double movement or this twofold movement of discipleship that I'd like to think with you about this morning. This movement of leaving behind fishing nets, forsaking everything to follow Jesus, and this movement of receiving life from Jesus. As you'll know from the introduction and from the title of this morning's chapel, uh, I've been asked to speak to you about homosexuality. It was at Wheaton during my junior year in 2003 that I first told another human being that I was wrestling firsthand with homosexuality. I'd grown up in a Christian home with two loving parents. From a young age, I'd been taught the Christian faith and I trusted in Jesus. I loved him and I wanted to follow him. Before I was willing to acknowledge after puberty the desires for my own sex that I was experiencing in an unremitting, exclusive way, I'd been taught from scripture that God created marriage for a man and a woman and that gay relationships therefore missed the mark of God's intention for human flourishing. And yet confusingly, I found myself just when all my friends were beginning to notice girls and become interested in dating, having longings to be in that kind of relationship with a member of my own sex. As a Christian, I needed guidance in how to respond to my sexuality in a way that honored God. 
But as you might imagine, I was nervous to tell my parents or my Christian friends in high school about my desires. I grew up in the Bible Belt in central Arkansas, where gay people don't exactly expect to find the warmest of welcomes all the time. So I found myself one winter day sitting in the office of a Wheaton professor telling him my biggest secret. We prayed together that day. We talked about what the future might hold for me in terms of friendships and other relationships. And we discussed God's compassion and tenderness in Jesus toward those who are broken in the midst of a sinful, fallen world. As I continued to read and think and pray and discovered more about Christianity's historic teaching, I found myself convinced of the position the church has held with almost total unanimity throughout the ages, that although many people find themselves through no fault of their own to have sexual desires for members of their own sex, this is not something to be affirmed and celebrated, but is a sign that we're broken, in need of redemption and recreation. Gay people are not uniquely broken. That's a position we share with every other human who's ever lived or every human who will live. But we are, nonetheless, broken. And following Jesus means turning our back on a life of sexual sin, just as it does for every other Christian. That's the position I remain convinced of to this day, based on what I read about God's creation of male and female in the book of Genesis and Jesus' reaffirmation of that scriptural teaching. As I think about my life of saying no to gay sex and a gay partnership, I find myself thinking about Mark chapter 10 and Peter's impetuous outburst to Jesus. See, Peter says, I've left everything to follow you. And I read that and I think I can second that. I feel much of the time that I'm turning my back on what would make me happiest and most fulfilled in life. And now that I'm about to turn 30 and a lot of my married friends are having children, I feel the ache of being without a partner. Do you see, Lord, I find myself praying, all that I'm giving up to follow you. And it's at this point that I'm beginning to hear Jesus answer to Peter as a word spoken for me, too. Truly I say to you, Jesus said to Peter, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. I hear in this passage a promise that feels very poignant to me. Truly, I say to you, Wes, there is no one who has left sex or a romantic relationship or marriage for my sake and the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. In the years since I've began to be open and talk about my story with my fellow Christians in the churches I've been, been part of, I found Jesus' words to be true. God has given me brothers and sisters and mothers and children. Knowing my choice to remain celibate, the Christians I've befriended have committed themselves through the unity secured by the Holy Spirit rather than through biological ties to being my family, whether or not I ever experience marriage myself. They've invited me into their homes. They've taken me on vacation with them. They've encouraged me to consider myself an older sibling to their children. But I've also experienced the darker side of Jesus' promise. All these new mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters are given along with persecutions. I'm sure I haven't experienced anything so dramatic as actual persecution, but I've known my share of sadness, pain, loneliness, and despair as I think about the prospect of lifelong celibacy. But in the midst of all this mingled joy and sorrow, I've known the hope of Jesus' final promise, in the age to come, eternal life. The ultimate gain that Jesus holds out to Peter is nothing less than a qualitatively different kind of life, one that never fades, loses its glory, one that encompasses the final renewal of creation itself. And that's the hope he holds out for me, 
life with God, beholding God, partaking in the newness of life that will come with the resurrection of the body and the unleashing of creation from its bondage to decay. If you're here this morning, sitting in this chapel, knowing yourself to be gay, or if you're here as a friend of a fellow student who's gay, I want to invite you to think about this double movement of discipleship in Mark chapter 10. First, Peter gives up everything to follow Jesus. And then Jesus promises him not only a new home and a new family, but a new life, eternal life. If you're someone here living with the reality of homosexual feelings, Jesus' message to you this morning is not primarily a no to your deepest self and your deepest hunger. I believe that discipleship to Jesus entails giving up gay sex and gay relationships, and that may be more painful than you can imagine right now in your life as a student. I say that as someone almost a decade removed from being a student at Wheaton. But ultimately, Jesus is offering you the kingdom. He's offering you eternal life. He's offering you himself in the gospel. He died for you. He rose for you. He loves you. Sacrificing your sexual freedom and sexual expression may seem like a high price to pay. It is a high price to pay. But he promises you a joy so great that if you felt the full weight of it now, you would literally come undone. I hear one more note in this story in Mark chapter 10 that I think applies not only to those with homosexual feelings, but also to those of you here who are not gay. Jesus promises to Peter that in leaving his family, he'll have a new family. Who, who is that? Who is the new family? The answer is the church, I think. In leaving behind his biological kin, Peter will find a new spiritual family, which means that all of us who name the name of Christ are meant to be family for one another. We who believe are now each other's brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children. And this means that if one of us is lonely, the others are there to link arms with that person and enfold them back into the family's fabric. If you are straight and the friend of a gay student, you are that student's brother or sister through the gospel. If you're gay and the friend of another student who's gay, you are that student's brother or sister through the gospel. You are part of Jesus' promise to them. God is giving you in love to that student living with homosexuality who has left everything to follow Jesus. So my prayer for Wheaton College, my prayer for this community, is that God will enable you to leave your nets behind and follow him wholeheartedly, forsaking everything like Peter did to find him. My prayer is that God will enable you to see your sacrifice, your surrender of your very self as no ultimate sacrifice. My prayer is that God will open your eyes to the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and to know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he sent, which is the eternal life of the age to come. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that the reality of Mark chapter 10 would come true in the Wheaton community, that we would all forsake everything to find Jesus, leaving our nets behind to run after him, and that in doing so, we would recognize that you are abundantly pouring out the life of the age to come for us. Lord, I pray we'd look to Jesus and see the one who died, who went all the way to the death of the cross for us who rose from the dead and who loves us with a love that is so unbelievably strong that we can commit our whole life to it. Lord, I pray for those living with the reality of homosexuality, I pray for those who are not, and I pray that there would be deep understanding, mutual burden bearing, and that there be the comfort of the Holy Spirit that's poured out into this community. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.